Hello everyone, it's Dr. Sam Hurst, and this is the eighth in our series of A Gothic A Day, Tempt the Vampires to Stay. Today I'm going to be, as usual, giving a brief introduction to a book, telling you uh, some of the main plot points, telling you why I think it's important, and also giving you some recommendations. And unusually, I'm going to start with those recommendations. <laughs> why? Well, because the book I'm going to be talking about today is a 1799 book, Sent Leon, by William Godwin. But this is not either the most famous or the best of his works, arguably. So I'm going to introduce you to those first as some extra recommended reading. His most famous work is Caleb Williams, which was written in 1794. And it's a really good example of the overlap between Godwin's work as a political philosopher, which we see in his inquiry concerning political justice, and his fiction. Because like an inquiry um, concerning political justice, Caleb Williams is focused on um, some of the problems of the British legal system as a tale of a servant escaping the persecution of his master after the servant learns a deadly secret. Mandeville by William Godwin is easily my favourite and that's because of the curious narrative voice. Godwin is incredibly experimental with his narrative voices, usually writing in the first person. And he, unusually enough, usually has an anti-hero or even a villain as this first person voice. And I would say that Mandeville is one of the first novels where you have the villain really providing a first person narrative throughout, but a villain who doesn't realise that he is the villain. But the book I'm going to talk about today is Saint Leon by William Godwin. The reason for that is because it focuses on a trope or a topic which becomes increasingly important in the Gothic. I'm not talking about the political ramifications and explorations that occur in the book, which do reflect some of the themes, particularly on the idea of a sort of utopian conception of communal immortality, which Godwin discusses in the inquiry concerning political justice in its second edition, I think. Um, the thing that I'm wanting to think about in regards to this is this interest in immortality and particularly this idea of the Rosicrucian hero. That is the hero who either discovers or is told the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir Vitae, giving him eternal life and infinite wealth. So this is a theme that comes up and appears in a number of Gothic texts at the time, one of which we're going to be talking about tomorrow, Melmoth the Wanderer, but is a consistent background feature of a number of other works, so do look out for it. Now, St. Leon is a first-person narrative again, told by the eponymous protagonist, uh, St. Leon, or Reginald de St. Leon, who's a French nobleman. We first meet him when he's a youth, goes off to war, and then ends up in Paris, living an increasingly dissolute life before his marriage to Marguerite. They go off, live in the country, and have a fairly idyllic life with their children, until he steps back to the city and falls back into his own ways, gambling to such an extent that he loses all his money, necessitating the sale of the family estates. Marguerite convinces him that to live as a peasant will be a more virtuous and useful life for them, and they go off, but keep having problems, <laughs> keep having to move location. Eventually, after living in one place for quite a long time, quite comfortably in a sense, not rich, but certainly living a good, honest life, a stranger appears, Zampieri, who offers St. Leon, under the direction of secrecy, he offers him the possibility of eternal life and eternal wealth, the Elixir Vitae and the Philosopher's Stone. And St. Leon is only too glad to take up this offer. And that's where everything starts to go really downhill. St. Leon is incapable of making good decisions, it seems. He keeps doing things like flashing his cash around in an inexplicable way. He gets blamed for the murder of Zampieri, who, it might be useful to know, is like, I want to die, that's why I want to give you these gifts. And at St. Leon at no point thought, hmm, maybe these gifts probably aren't that great if he wants to die because of them. Nope. Anyway, St. Leon goes on, he has to keep moving, he has to keep uh, fleeing because he keeps getting imprisoned. Eventually his wife dies because of all of these vicissitudes and he sort of gets rid of his daughters. His son's already run off because of the disgrace and the shame. And then um, St. Leon proceeds on his own. He ends up in the Inquisition, lives there until he's about 80 before he manages to escape. There's quite a lot of overlap in the story between Melmoth the Wanderer and this that we're going to see uh, tomorrow, Melmoth the Wanderer, because there is an escape aided by an unwilling Jewish character. But St. Leon takes the elixir and is able to escape perfectly well because now he looks like a young man again. 
he decides with pretty much a savior complex that he's going to try and do good with his money and his long life and heads to Hungary, which is in the middle of a Hungarian-Turkic war. And he sort of messes with the local economy, messes everything up and makes friends with a, uh, a misanthrope called Betham Gabor. He thinks that they're the same, that they both kind of are like, yeah, humanity's gross and horrible and I hate life and everything's unfair and ugh. But Betham Gabor takes this a lot more seriously. He takes it so seriously that he's incredibly annoyed by St. Leon's attempts to sort of aid the local economy and ends up kidnapping him to his castle, where St. Leon spends a, num a long time in prison, um, imprisoned. And there's a very curious scene where Bethlehem Gabor, once the castle is attacked, says, OK, I'm going to set you free, but like, stay here, OK? And St. Leon's like, yeah, no, of course, I will. And he stays there for six hours before he even attempts to escape in an unlocked room. <laughs> anyway... He gets rescued actually by his son, who of course doesn't recognize him. And it's set up for a happy ending, except it all goes terribly awry because St. Leon once again threw the spanner in his own works. Throughout there's this idea of him like, oh, I'm trying my best. I'm just, why do things keep going wrong? But the thing that he can never recognize is his own uh, sort of, it's his own fault. <laughs> consistently it's his own fault it's his own weakness it's his own decisions and his own savior complex it's his inability to admit that he's wrong or that he is unsure or that he is uh, misunderstanding the situation that leads to every subsequent event so it's an interesting book he goes through a number of gothic adventures and it's certainly an interesting protagonist. It can get a little bit wearing because he is a very wearing man and it is his voice that you're hearing throughout but, you know, just try and get past it. Try and push through. Anyway, I hope that you enjoy this read and discover a writer that perhaps not as many people are familiar with and a book that is less familiar as well. One last recommendation before I go. If you enjoy this inquiry into immortality, you might think about reading his daughter Mary Shelley's story as well, The Mortal Immortal, which picks up on some of these themes and offers an interesting contrast to Godwin's longer work. Anyway. See you tomorrow. Goodbye.